Right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Wu Yu event. Tonight, we are blessed with Dr. Paul Karpecki's presence, and he is going to review Demodex blepharitis, prevalence, burden, and current management approaches and emerging treatments. Okay, there we go. Woo -woo. Yeah. All right, so I'll be your host tonight, Dr. Ariel Serenzi. So um, we were laughing when we were doing our rehearsal because uh, this is like the shortest bio for one of the most impressive doctors on the uh, planet for dry eye disease. Um, but he has the largest advanced ocular surface disease clinic in, in the United States. And we were talking a little bit about the, the size of his practice. I wish that you would have pictures of how cool your practice is with the you know second floor, whole floor being dedicated to the dry eye space. But yeah. um, a fun fact is he has over 1,000 Sjogren patients. So um, we're going to get to see a lot of cool images and learn a lot of amazing things from somebody that's doing it in the trenches every day. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. There is Thank financial you. disclosures and all of which have been mitigated. So I'll have you take it from here. Thanks, Ariel. Great introduction uh, all around on that. Uh, and, th and thanks for the opportunity to get to participate. This is actually very exciting because it's a new drug. We, we don't get too many opportunities to uh, present at a program of this magnitude, you know, Wu Yu has just huge following, which I love. And uh, congratulations to this whole team, Ariel, Stephanie, Jenna, so many who do such a great job um, and have certainly earned that because they're looking out for optometry first. And I, and I love when they uh, when that happens. And so it's honored to be part of this. This is just talking about later on, you know, the program. So our goal today is to kind of go over, first of all, Demodex blepharitis just as an introduction. And uh, really, this is the most common ectoparasite in human beings. It's extremely common to have this. In fact, 61% of all blepharitis is essentially, or 69% of that. And there are about 58% of people who just walk into our offices who have Demodex blepharitis. There's two forms. There's, there's Demodex folliculorum and there's Demodex brevis. The follicularum form is interesting in the sense that it's the one that we think of when it comes to the lashes. It's the one that's present um, whenever a patient kind of presents into our office. And it's the uh, most likely one that you're gonna see uh, when you start to have patients look down um, at their eyes, at their eyelashes as you scan across. But brevis is also important because it gets into the meibomian glands and it gets in the sebaceous glands. So patients who suffer from rosacea often have a lot of demodex brevis. So these are, you know, really small little mites. They're parasites, as we know, 0.3 to 4 nanometers in length uh, on the lashes. So extremely small, but under magnification, you can see them. And brevis is actually about one third to one fourth of that size at 0.1 millimeters. The life cycle, and this is really important because we have a new drug that we're prescribing twice a day for six weeks. And why six weeks and why stop? Well, this is part of why you only use it for six weeks but why you should use it the entire time. I had my first patient that I put on this, I was able to actually see. Um, and uh, that actually came back uh, day before yesterday. And of course only had about six days on the drug. And I know it's an N of one, so don't take this into your account for being every patient, but cleanest eyelids I've ever seen of a Demodex patient after six days. Now I, I have told patients, put the drop in the eye, and rub the lashes with all the excess. So maybe that's a little different than what the prescribing instructions state, but I think getting it onto that base of the lashes and this patient was really doing that diligently probably played a huge role. So my thought was, okay, should we stop the medication? Of course not. The life cycle of Demodex mite is approximately 14 to 18 days. So you think, okay, maybe I can stop it at three weeks. Well, that's egg to larva. There's approximately five days of which they're spent as an adult. And then you've got the nits and the eggs who go through that same cycle. So hence, six weeks of duration based on understanding the life cycle of this drug, of this, of this bug, uh, and why we use the drug for that period of time. So what is Demodex blepharitis? Well, we all know blepharitis or any itis just basically means inflammation. There isn't much more to it than that. Uh, inflammation can be found by erythema. It can be found by edema, irritation. But, you know, this is the cool part of it here. Almost seven out of 10 cases of blepharitis are due to Demodex. You know, in my clinic, I'd probably say it's 95%, but my clinic is only referral. I don't take any patients who can walk directly in. I, it sounds crazy, but it got so backed up to where my colleagues were saying, hey, Paul, it takes four months to get a patient to you. 
Um, so that was the only solution was just to only take referral patients. And that's got it down to about two months and that's helped. But so maybe that's why it's 95% because we've never had really good treatments for demodex blepharitis. But because if you look at the literature, it's actually about 69%. And it's implicated in these eyelashes, the eyelids, the meibomian glands, and leads to MGD, meibomian gland dysfunction. These uh, They have a propensity for epithelial cells, believe it or not, and oil dispensing glands. So we always wonder about that, but that's why people think there might be something related even to rosacea and demodex as somewhat of a comorbidity in certain cases. More research needed there, but it would make sense given how it is involved in sebaceous glands. And it could even be playing a role sometimes in patients who get peripheral infiltrates, who get inflammation of the cornea, keratitis, inferior staining, things like that could play a role also. We'll differentiate those today. First, some myths. I thought this would be a good place to put this in is, hey, what do we know and what is actually not accurate? Patients are going to be asking you this because they are here about this new drug eventually, um, or you bring up the fact that they have blepharitis because you've scanned that upper eyelid really well and you can tell that is present. Uh, and you talk about, hey, we have a treatment for this or what we're doing simply today. Questions might come up. Well, one thing that probably doesn't come up from patients, but I've heard it come up at symposia is demodex mites are only active at night. So patients who get a lot of symptoms at night may have demodex. That, not true. Um, well, there is something to it. I shouldn't say not true. You know, the demodex mites actually are very photosensitive. So they, they don't like when it's bright. They wouldn't want to, you know, come out when there's sunlight or if you're, you're outside, things like that uh, really kind of play a role. So, you know, I think for the most part, um, you know, I, for the, you really want to be expecting that they're going to be active evening time when it's darker, but they're housed so far sometimes into the glands that it's dark enough there that they're not photosensitized. So they're active all day long. So that's a little bit of a myth. While bright lights may make them, you know, retract, it doesn't mean they aren't active. They're active at all times. Uh, regular cleaning of towels and bed sheets can help manage infestations. Uh, another myth, uh, there's no evidence that actually hygiene or lit or washing sheets, uh, you know, bleaching sheets can mitigate symptoms in humans. They tend to be very specific in where they want to be. They tend to get inside the glands, inside the lash follicle, so not likely to be uh, alive long on towels and on bed sheets anyways. Really wouldn't make that much of a difference there. Uh, mites are transferred through direct contact. You know, this is one you probably have to bring up because I, I remember a patient came into my office number of years ago, and I diagnosed them with uh, demodex blepharitis. And the, I was first introduced to demodex blepharitis as a diagnosis by Donald Korb about, this must've been 18, 20 years ago. I was at his office trying to learn this thing of dry eye. And he's such a legend and so he knew so much. He was like 10 years ahead of almost every researcher in the field. And, and he had me look at a patient and the patient had this junk on their lashes right at the base. And he said, Paul, what is that? I said, is that Demodex? That's the first time I'd ever recognized. He goes, yes, that's Demodex. That's the first time I had that aha moment by having the patient just look down. And uh, nevertheless, I've had a patient a number of years later who came in. And of course, I looked at the lashes, remembered that that's what it was and said, oh, you've got this thing called Demodex. Today, I don't use the word because then they look up, you know, ectoparasite and that spooks them out. So I say, you know, something Ben Gaddy, I remember hearing him saying when I was in clinic with him many years ago, he said he called it microorganisms. I kind of like that broad statement of it. Uh, but just you have these microorganisms and they've over uh, are in overabundance. We got to get them back to normal. That might be better. But anyways, I didn't know that then. This might have been, I don't know how many, a decade ago. So I said, you got these dish called Demodex and uh, it's these mites that get accumulate. And uh, anyways, comes back a, a month later. And he's one of the few people that with obviously a lot of effort, he scrubbed them down. I said, you've really improved dramatically. I'm kind of surprised because it usually takes a long time to do anything. And I remember him saying to me, do you mind telling my wife that? And I said, why? I guess she wasn't there the second time. She goes, well, ever since that first exam with you, she hasn't slept in the same bed with me. And I thought, wow, I got to be careful how I say things. So mites are not transferred by direct contact. I, swear I should have known that then to tell him so he could tell his spouse. They, uh, they're not. In fact, dogs have Demodex, it's called mange. It's one of the uh, more common conditions. Uh, we've all heard of mangy dogs and stuff. That's just Demodex infestation. We're not even sure that is directly correspondent to humans as far as transfer. Certainly human human is not. And then finally, Demodex mites are a result of poor personal hygiene. And that is absolutely not. If you look at the prevalence data, it doesn't care how much 
status or money or what kind of house you live in. Demodex mites are pretty much ubiquitous in people as far as accumulating in some people. Maybe it is racial, maybe it's other things, maybe it's age, maybe it is comorbidity with rosacea, but they don't care about your your hygiene and where you live and anything like that. It's pretty, you know, in fact, I have one patient who is that very high level uh, old money horse country patient who had a severe form of Demodex and she was aghast. Um, I didn't tell her it was Demodex, but I showed her her eyelids under the camera. And uh, so it, she took it not very, very well at all, wanted to do whatever it took, whatever procedure, wherever she had to fly to. And I'm like, I don't know, there's many other places you can even go to at that time for this. It was good evidence that it really doesn't care um, who has it. It's just not related to poor hygiene or over hygiene or anything like that. All right. So that's enough of kind of an introduction. It's kind of nice to know some of these fun facts, though. You may ask questions, get questions on it, but let's get into the real meat of the presentation, which is diagnosis and prevalence uh, of the condition. So this is, again, and I apologize for the small screen. I've never had Zoom not work. Uh, and I may try it again later, but let's hold on to what we've got working now while we have the chance. And I'll try to make the screen as big as I can, maybe this way. There we go. That's a little better. Let's do that. Uh, if you look at the base of the lashes, you can actually see the uh, microorganism, the mite, its its legs at the bottom there. So if you weren't grossed out earlier, we're going to make sure you are by the end of this presentation. You see all of that, you know, accumulating on the lash. And that's kind of how it does. The head is inside. The tail sits outside. The collarettes are a combination of the mite itself, but more often just the extrusion of debris and bad mybum and everything else that comes out as it digs its way down there and causes more irritation. But these are cylindrical sleeves. I don't even call them dandruff because they're not really white all the time. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're clear. So I really just call it a clear sleeve, so to speak, or whitish sleeve at the base of the lashes. And it's the pathomonic sign of Demodex blepharitis. Of course, I don't think you need to magnify like this. I th in fact, I'm gonna show you more images here in a moment that really kind of put it in perspective. I put this slide in first, just because it shows that it gets well into the follicle, well into the lash follicle. And that's why often you just see the collarette at the base. And you can have as many as 25 mites per follicle uh, has been demonstrated in patients before. So the best way to look at making the diagnosis is really this patient has eyelid, upper eyelid tattooing there. They, they're prone to all kinds of MGD when they do that. And I think even blepharitis, but nevertheless, the patient's looking down, you can see at the base of the lashes, uh, these collarettes that are present. The one on the right is a very extreme example. That's probably atypical. The one on the left is very typical. We just have these little white nubs or clear sleeves that can be there to confidently help you make a diagnosis of demodex blepharitis. They're identified by nothing more than your standard slit lamp. You don't need microscopes. You don't need extra equipment, extra lighting. The only thing is that when you scan the lashes, you might have to increase the magnification from 10 to 16. That helps you see them a little better. And that's what these are at 16 magnification. I could see them a lot better than at the 10. But patients just look down, you scan the lid margin, and that pretty much is it. Um, so if you take a look at this video to the right, obviously I'm looking at the patient, I gotta get her lined up. There we are, line it up. And I look at that lash line. Well, I see a little area of matarosis, but I didn't see any colorettes at all. Now, when I have her look down, I'm starting to see them. And when I increase the magnification, I can definitely clearly see what's going on there. And uh, we have, you know, good view. But these the images to the right also show, especially this one, kind of that bottom left out of the four that's there. You can see the any of those little nubs, so to speak, are collarettes. And that's the thing we want to be looking at for in these patients um, as our findings. So looking straight on, you might miss them. Right? It's hard to see them there. I mean, you could see them now that you know what you're looking for, but you don't see much of it looking down. Then I could definitely see them as being present. So there's a number of scales that are out there as far as understanding what level to be in. This is the one that was used in the clinical trials. It's very nonlinear, meaning a grade of zero to two means uh, zero. So if you saw one or two, and quite frankly, if I only saw one, maybe even two, I probably am not gonna treat them unless they're very symptomatic. But when I start getting stage one, which is three to 10 lashes involved, or two, which is 10 to a third of the lash margins, or grade three, which now you're looking at anywhere from a third to two thirds, or four, which is 100% of it, even one, I'm gonna treat them. I just don't want this to keep progressing. I don't want them to have recurrent horteola or chalasia, or lid margin, you know, 
scalloping or loss of lashes or thinning of lashes. I mean, I, don't, I think if there's any patient that I'd say, hey, I could leave this and you can get all these things. Do you want to do that or do you want to treat it? I think even asymptomatic, I'd want to treat it. I wouldn't treat zero, even if there were two colorettes, but I would, unless they were symptomatic, but I would definitely treat one, two, three, and four, symptomatic or not. I think it's really important to be able to just look for them. And if you have more than two, it's time to consider some treatments. You also want to tend to see, you know, the level of inflammation. These cause a lot of damage and inflammation, these demodex mites. And so you can go from mild to moderate to severe. And we're going to cover that a little bit in the studies also. Now, this I think is important. Are the clinical manifestations of demodex blepharitis? The, what we talked about, the reason for treating these patients might well be the results if we don't treat them. What happens if I decide, hey, we're just going to let this go. You're not feeling it. It's a grade one or two. Well, disorders that are known to be a common with time and with demodex blepharitis um, is just simply the infestation of lashes leads to those colorettes. But then there's thinning of lashes, there's loss or matterosis of lashes, severe lid margin inflammation, meibomian gland dysfunction, which eventually leads to evaporative dry eye. Of course, evaporative dry eye is dry eye because of meibomian glands that don't function well. Uh, the chronic inflammation can lead to conjunctival issues where you have staining over the conj. Uh, corneal manifestations, especially with brevis, include peripheral marginal infiltrates. You know, we always think, well, it's got to be staph related. I've seen marginal infiltrates in patients and I have them look down and it is clearly demodex. Staph would show up more yellow in discharge color and demodex is the clear sleeves at the base of the lashes. And then uh, the cytoskeleton of mites may act in foreign body trigger and granulomatous reactions uh, that we've seen that in chalasia, recurrent hordeola, and other problems like that. I'm going to throw in a really quick case. I know this isn't completely tied into Demodex, but it's the fourth one of these I've had in my career. And I thought, you know what? It wouldn't be bad to share this with my good colleagues to say, hey, watch out for the recurrent chalasian. It's a 43-year-old young man uh, presented with uh, chalasian that was removed in the exact same place. Anytime you have a lesion that returns to the same place, you've got to be cautious. Well, he's actually had three. This first time he, he came from another state, um, but he said, yes, they're in that left upper lid, exactly the same place. And this is just like in the last four to five years. Anything scary about that eyelid? Anything that displaces normal tissue frightens me. I mean, the fact that there's no lashes in that area is really, you know, pretty significant for, for pathology that could be very serious. Anything displaces a normal tissue. This is one of the other patients. This one's an old image. This might be about 20 years old. Another patient, the same thing, which shows the matterosis. I mean, the first one actually showed the matterosis better because there are no lashes where that recurrent, so to speak, chalazian is. But here again, we're missing lashes. I use this one because you can see kind of from the midline over the lashes look pretty good, but from the midline and medially, they're sparse. There's one here, there's one there. It looks like a red bump on the upper eyelid. Um, I averted that upper eyelid later and you could tell this turned out to be a sebaceous carcinoma. These are very malignant. I think they're malignant because they don't get diagnosed um, in the sense that they can metastasize. Mortality rate is about 30%. Averted the upper eyelid and there's a tumor. Uh, there is the actual carcinoma itself that and a uh, patient had to have almost the whole upper eyelid removed. It was, it was not as bad as a basal cell for being aggressive in movement, but really did pretty much affect his entire eyelid to get that controlled. So they're highly malignant, infiltrative, and they metastasize. Mortality rate is high as 30%, can masquerade as a chalazian. Watch for matterosis, displaced tissue. That's not normal because after this presentation, you're going to be looking at eyelids much more closely you're going to be noticing areas of matterosis. If it has an area of recurrent chalasia, be very careful. Okay. That's a little sidebar commercial because I just happened to have one of these in the last month, as I said, but um, it's only been four in 30 years. So obviously not very common, but let's get back to something very common, demodex blepharitis. Although this isn't a common presentation. This is pretty severe. You'll get a few of these, but you're not going to get these every time. You're really looking for those real subtle ones like we looked at earlier. So what are those subtle signs and symptoms of demodex blepharitis? Let me know the most common symptom. It's actually itching. You know, we used to think for years, okay, itching, allergies. Well, if the itching's in the canthal region, then it is allergies, it's allergic conjunctivitis. But if the patient says, and this, I've got this a lot, I've learned over the years that if someone says itching, you have to ask, where does it itch? And if they do this on the lid margins, start looking for demodex blepharitis. 
That's one of the more common symptoms, but dry eyes, photophobia, lid margin inflammation, of course, you can see that, but blurred vision, tearing, your redness, missing misdirected lashes, thin lashes, contact lens intolerance, foreign body sensation, all of those are common symptoms associated with demodex blepharitis. I think a lot of patients with dry eye eventually develop dry eye if they've had demodex because the meibomian glands get pretty trashed by this condition. But as a whole, many early uh, not yet dry eye cases are probably demodex blepharitis and they have similar symptoms other than perhaps more itching. About 60% of patients visiting eye clinics each year have cholerets. This was a really cool study, a Titan study that just was all comers. You could have glaucoma, come in for spectacles, contact lenses, dry eye. It took all patients. You couldn't miss anybody. And what's fascinating is that 58% of all patients walking into an optometry clinic had demodex blepharitis. Uh, it's a group that was told to have the patients look down, turn up the magnification, scan the lid margin. And 58% of the time it was present. 69% of blepharitis cases were demodex, as people who already had a diagnosis of blepharitis, but now isolated what it was. 60% of patients uh, prescribed with dry eye disease medications like cyclosporin, lofitograst had demodex. Makes you wonder if maybe that was the condition itself. 56% of cataract patients, we do see a little more with age and 51%, 51% of contact lens wearers in this study had signs of blepharitis, specifically demodex because of cholerets. So the takeaways from this section, it's present in about 60% of all people. Now, I want you to look tomorrow. I don't know if that's the number you'll get, but that was a study that looked at all patients visiting eye care partners, providers, including ophthalmologists and optometrists. That means there are probably about 25 million people if you extrapolate that out in the US. The great thing is you don't need any special equipment to diagnose demodex blepharitis. You need your slit lamp and you need to scan the upper eyelid under slightly higher magnification while they're looking down. There's nothing else to it. Uh, you basically, you know, I love taking pictures to show patients. I tell them they've got these microorganisms as we talked about. Uh, you know, when you see cholerets, ask about, you know, the patient's symptoms. They may or may not be there, but either way, because of the sequelae, we tend to treat these patients. But the great thing is cholerets are pathognomonic for demodex blepharitis. You know, that's what's happening. There were years ago when I actually had a microscope and we would look at it. This was probably 25 years ago. It, it's pointless to do that because quite frankly, every time you saw cholerets, it was always positive. So you just wasted a lot of time trying to look for them. So you've got a slit lamp. That's all you need. Now, this part I think is kind of important. It's the psychosocial burden. And I talked about that with, well, the very, very wealthy Kentucky lady who couldn't believe it was possible that she could have this condition that she thought would be caused by poor hygiene. And it's not. It doesn't care your, how clean you are or what you live in, what mansion or whatever. And also had the, you know, other patients who, well, the spouse wouldn't sleep with her, with him because he had this demodex condition. Uh, so I've learned to use different words. I've had patients, believe it or not, who have gotten so, they felt like they could feel them. So there is different levels of psychosocial burden. You can't really feel them. I've had colleagues who said they had patients who shaved their eyebrows. So you do want to educate in a nice way, but keep in mind, there is a psychosocial burden of demodex blepharitis. Um, frequency of most common symptom was itching. We already covered that. So part of the psychosocial burden is just that our eyes get red. They tear a lot. They get blurry vision. They feel itchy. So they're always aware of it. Uh, symptom duration, though, 51% of patients actually had uh, these symptoms for more than four years. 58% have never been diagnosed with blepharitis. So here's a wonderful opportunity. That's why I'm so glad you're part of the presentation today to recognize that you're going to be one of the first people that may make the diagnosis of blepharitis by knowing what to look for, which it probably wasn't just developing there. It might've been there for a while. So uh, that's what was evidence here with half the patients having it for more than four years. 33% of patients had made at least two and as many as six or more visits to a doctor for this condition without diagnosis. You know, for one, you know, we never really did talk a lot about diagnosing this condition, looking down. A lot of times we don't have a lot of treatments. We don't tend to look for stuff. And quite frankly, how many of you had a chance to go and spend time with someone who was writing all the textbooks and could teach you, like I learned from Don Corb about this so long ago? You know, it just, it's not a practical thing. We Now it becomes very easy to look for it. Now we have a drug for it. Now we have new 
treatments are understanding for it. So I think we're going to start to see that these numbers go away pretty quickly. But these patients really were very conscious of their eyes. The highest percentage was that awareness of my eyes at 50%, uh, roughly 47%. And with that was difficulty driving at night, uh, wearing makeup, it says women only, don't always be sure about that. Addition time needed for daily hygiene routine, negative appearance of eyes and eyelids to others, conscious of others thinking if they could see how it was going on, the redness, constantly worrying about their eyes, et cetera. So there is a, a, an impact on the quality of life with this condition. Let's talk about co con con concomitant or comorbid disorders. Uh, so one of the more common things in that same Triton study we looked at earlier, the prevalence of demodex blepharitis was present in dry eye disease almost 60% of the time. That's a, a large you know, percentage of dry eye patients may have just had blepharitis and may have been demodex. But glaucoma patients, we wondered, is this because of prostaglandin analogs? Is this from the chronic BAK that's used in drops? Is it just age-related? It was 65% of glaucoma patients. The contact lens one's the one that always stands out for me. Half the patients who wear contact lenses, which is smaller than some of the other subgroups here, but half of them had collarettes indicative of demodex. Uh, obviously, meibomian gland dysfunction, I would have thought that'd be a higher number because we do know that brevis gets in the meibomian glands, but it was only 57%, still high. And then uh, 58 of all comers walking into an office. Rosacea is the one I really want to isolate as a co-comitant disease. The way that you make a diagnosis of ocular rosacea, as you all know, is look for telangiectatic vessels on the eyelids, um, but then look at the face too when they first walk in. Sometimes, you know, patients can be, women can be wearing makeup and you don't see it. So the telangiectatic vessels on the eyelid become very important for making that diagnosis as you see in this image. Uh, there are many immunosuppression, diabetes, sebaceous hyperplasia, and other things that could allow for demodex proliferation, but rosacea for me is really a major group. 59% of patients presenting with facial rosacea had demodex. I feel like in my clinic, it's probably higher than that, but that's what the research shows in this particular study that we're referencing. So it is one that you do want to look for. There are thoughts that they that it could be a cause or it could be a result. We're not really sure. I think you do have to look for meibomian gland dysfunction, evaporative dry eye, because that also has a high association, 59% of demodex blepharitis cases. So expressing those eyelids here, we got a paddle behind the eyelid at the back and my thumb on the front and I'm milking the paddle up to try and see what comes out of the glands is coming out like toothpaste uh, is pred, but always look at lashes. One that we see a lot of demodex blepharitis in are patients with inadequate lid seal. Again, this is some of Don Kor's work, but it's not a, this is not lagophthalmos. Lagophthalmos is when eyelids, you know, one's up here and one's down here. And, and that's pretty rare. Uh, this is called inadequate lid seal. Our eyelids actually touch at the very tip. I didn't realize that, but they actually create a seal at nighttime. And that allows the meibomian glands to kind of recalibrate or, or help themselves and have a nice moist, humid environment for them to recover overnight. It's a very dry time at night because you're not blinking. So you have to have that seal in place. Uh, and patients who have morning symptoms often have this condition, not demodex. They have inadequate lid seal. And when you take a pen light or a transilluminator to their closed eye in a dark lane, you actually see this beam of light coming out the bottom as you have there. You can make your diagnosis, but really anyone with morning symptoms typically has this. But I have found that these patients have a significant amount of demodex blepharitis. And I don't know if it's the seal maybe allows them to get in more. I have no clue completely hypothesizing here, but this is a common comorbid condition where demodex is often present but I think the seal is the cause, the lack of seal. These patients all get pretty bad dry eye because they, they're supposed to recover overnight and they don't, so they start bad and they get worse. Anyone with morning symptoms, think of this condition. Sometimes you get good hints though, like inferior corneal staining, that will also tell you you likely have inadequate lid seal. So takeaways, demodex is common. Uh, patients with ocular surface diseases, 51% of contact lens wearers, 65% of glaucoma patients, uh, very common in rosacea. There's a number of studies that have shown a high correlation and uh, definitely associated with meibomian gland dysfunction, evaporative dry eye because it gets in the meibomian glands. Makes sense. And, you know, you start with meibomian gland dysfunction. If that gets bad enough and fewer glands are working, then that's when you get evaporative dry eye. They are kind of separate conditions, even though there's overlap. And then an inadequate lid seal, which we talked about with the morning symptoms and a cool little test called the core blackie test to be able to find it. All right, let's do a couple quick case studies in the interest of time. These will not take long, but I think they isolate a few key things. 
This patient's suffering from chronic left right. She had the right diagnosis, um, but she said she's had it for a lifetime, meaning it never felt like it's gone away. She visits several eye care professionals. This is something we hear a lot. And, and that's why it's so good to have so many on the call because we finally have our first RX drug for this. We're gonna talk about treatments in a moment. She hasn't gone prior lid surgery. Sometimes that creates the inadequate lid seal that can lead to this also. In some cases, you don't have to have that to get Demodex though. Demodex is too prevalent. Uh, diagnosed with dry eye, um, longstanding panis osmolarity was normal. When I see a normal osmolarity, I question if it really is dry eye. Probably it's just Demodex, probably just blepharitis. She's used lid scrubs and the online forum discussions focused on the antibiotic therapy. So who the person who took this, I'm trying to remember who took this case, um, but they, they just went to one of the online forums and took a case that was being presented. And this was about a year ago. So we don't know as much as we would know today. And the forum basically said, oh, try azocyte, try all these things. None of them are related to Demodex. So it just showed where we got a ways to go to make this diagnosis. Here's another case, uh, a man with normal blood work and no underlying health conditions continued to have issues. Uh, he'd had multiple rounds of radiofrequency and IPL. And basically, despite months of suffering, the doctor never considered Demodex. That's why we're putting on courses now. It's not thought of. And here's a 26-year-old patient. Her symptoms began two years ago following a hair dye treatment, is what she recalls, and not getting any, any better. But if you look at her lashes, you can see the little pinpoint white dots there. Uh, you know, there was no chemical energy, none of the pathways they were going for. And again, never considered Demodex. So I love these cases because they're real world. And not to pick on colleagues. In fact, I didn't even put these three cases together. I, I got them from a colleague of mine who said, hey, this would be good to put in here because it just shows how we're, we're not looking for something like this. And it'd be really important that we start looking for that. So Demodex blood is routinely misdiagnosed or missed. It is a uh, these, it's common, you know, presenting with yellow debris on her lashes only could actually be staphylococcal and antibiotics, hypochlorous acid, surfactant cleaners all work well but check for cholerats because when they don't respond, it's often Demodex. And then finally, what can we do to treat this condition based on where we're at? Well, there's actually a drug approved. We already covered that, but I'm gonna cover all the stuff that isn't yet avail is available, but not the actual RX drug, just to show you that there are other options to balance things out. Now, this is the first and only treatment for Demodex blepharitis. And it was recently approved, like within the last, what, four to six weeks, maybe? It's also only became available as a prescription a week ago to 10 days. Uh, and I've, so again, I have uh, only about 15 patients so far, maybe 20 I've prescribed it to. I've had one come back. I'm going to get a whole bunch more back. I was amazed at the results, but that's one. Dosing's BID for six weeks. Remember why we talked about six weeks dosing? It has to do with the cycle of the mite, 15 to 18 days, five days as an adult. That's when it causes a lot of the damage. But then you also have the eggs and the nits, and then you've got another 15 to 18 days. So you add those together, you get a six-week cycle. While the drive, it does say BID, I do recommend rubbing it in the lashes um, and rubbing it, you know, even around if you have the all the excess drop. That way you get in the meibomian glands, you get in the lash follicles, you get a little lid scrub going on with it. So that's my recommendation. I know that's not in the PI, but that is really, I think, what made it so effective in the first patient because uh, he was actually able to rub it in there. And he said he, he even felt like it was actually clearing the skin around the eye. But this is for blepharitis, but why not just use the excess to rub the blepharitis itself? Current management approaches, there are other options. Tea tree oil is an option. Now, high doses are tough. Patients, you know, on the 50% uh, for terpenials, I, you know, I usually save those for patients I don't want back. They burn a lot. Uh, you know, it's hard. They work, but that's so much discomfort, the patient usually won't return. The low concentrations of tea tree might work on a mild case, but they certainly don't work on even moderate. Uh, it's just not enough for it. Antibiotics will not work um, like erythromycin, except if it's bacterial, uh, maybe a little anti-inflammatory ability for that and doxycyclines, tetracyclines. Metronidazole, you know, is one that you use for the skin, uh, but it wouldn't be on the eye. And there's an oral form as well, but there's topical. Now, Manuka honey, coconut oil, aloe vera, actually I've had good success with that as an eyelid cleanser. Surprisingly good. Um, not to the level of what we're gonna get with a prescription drop, but for the mild cases, maybe even moderate, it's the best I've seen uh, for these patients. 
And those come in in uh, spray that you then wipe on the eyelids. Uh, ivermectin is an oral form, but you have to get the right prescribing amounts per kilogram. That's a that's a bit of an overkill, in my opinion. Hypochlorous acid. I put a little star there uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, has not been shown to work. As much as I like hypochlorous acid, I think it's wonderful for staphylococcal blepharitis and just a very natural way to kind of treat things. There's the research that was done by Alan Cabot. It was a cool study where he took uh, Demodex mites off of a lash, like eight or nine, put them under a slide. One slide, he put oil. And the Demodex mites didn't mind the oil. In fact, they were still swimming around 24 hours later. In another slide, he put hypochlorous acid. In another slide, he put tea tree oil. The tea tree oil worked. They died between three and six hours. The hypochlorous acid, they're still swimming around. They were pretty happy in that too, but not as good as an oil, which they're the happiest in. So it just didn't really affect them. Um, some people say, well, it kills the food supply. Well, the food supply for Demodex is pretty broad. They don't mind bad mybum. They don't mind a lot of other stuff. So it's not just bacteria. Silicone brushes, there are those that exist. In fact, the Manuka Honey Coconut Oil Aloe Vera product has a brush that comes with it. I don't like the brush. A little irritant, uh, but I do like the solution a lot um, for those patients with that mild to moderate case. We have done IPL on a lot of our Demodex patients for years with good success, especially blue low-level light therapy after IPL. Uh, that has worked extremely well, but you're looking at $1,200, $1,500, you know, average for these things or in that range. So it's a little expensive way of doing it. <clears throat> Microbial exfoliation is very effective at debulking the cholerets, but I'm not so sure well it works for eradication unless you do it on a very frequent basis. But I do think it's a good adjunct and a good thing to have. So tea tree oil or terpeniol is a essential oil composed of monoterpenes derived from the leaves of this particular um, maluka type uh, leaf. And, and what it does is it has an active ingredient known as terpeni, terpenforol or for terpeniol sometimes described as. It's an anti-inflammatory antimicrobial. And it comes in anywhere from 5% to 50. The fives will often get it mild cases quite well. The 50s will work, but very they, not very comfortable. So those do exist out there. They have a strong menthol sensation. There is some studies that question, could they actually damage glands over time? Um, again, may depend on the concentration and the duration of use um, in these patients. This was a randomized uh, lid scrub with microblepharal exfoliation for treatment of Demodex that showed really good success. So sometimes uh, the combinations may do well where you do a mechanical cleaning and then have that for use. Uh, but this was the study I referred to that did show after 50 minutes of exposure, uh, human myeloma gland epithelial cells did show some atrophy. So there's questions of long-term. I do think this the problem with this study is it's a bit <clears throat> in vitro, not real world, not active. They're sitting there under the, the scope. And of course, these are higher concentrations that remain on them as opposed to wipes and washing, but it certainly is discussion. There is research to show Manuka honey extract. It's not actually honey, it's the leaf extract, uh, the extract from the leaves themselves. Coconut oil and aloe vera has very good success in Demodex treatment. Uh, so does uh, coconut oil um, in of itself, as far as an option for maybe smoothing that out. And aloe vera has been shown to create a little bit of a, a suffocating type of uh, oil to it as well. So that's a neat combination that is available as an over-the-counter product. There is also intense pulse light therapy, very effective for Demodex, but of course, out of patient pocket pay. Uh, but these two groups of patients showed a significant improvement. And I'm a big fan of low level light therapy with the blue mask after it to get that extra effect. Topical ivermectin, while it will work to some extent, 50% uh, reduction from two to one, you know, you have to know the weight of the patient, you have to know the amount to put, you have to get that all weighed out, and then you dose it one or two times over a period of time. The microblepharic exfoliation, which we covered, did show significant improvement, and you do debulk the condition, a lot of the blepharitis. So my point to this is these are all good, compatible, two therapeutic treatments. They all seem to work quite well, and, uh, and we talked already about oral ivermectin. But that leaves us really with the latest drug uh, for approval, and that's Lodolaner. And Lodolaner is 0.25%. The origin of this drop is actually an oral pill originally, not for humans, but in veterinary medicine. It was used in the front line where dogs would eat this thing and uh, the Lodolaner, and it would kill all the Demodex. And all the mange, which dog, mangy dog is a Demodex dog, would disappear. 
And that's the that's where the original treatment came from. Now, this had to be studied in the eyes, 0.25%. Uh, for approval for a very low concentration. And finally, to get approved August 2023. So we're just recent approval. This is you know, really uh, one of the first presentations uh, we've all had a chance to kind of have on here. I think there's been a couple of webinars, maybe. But it's my first time to get to present on it since this drug has been approved. Uh, Thalmic topical eye drop twice a day for six weeks. And that should give you a long duration of effect. So you're not it's not like a dry eye product where you just keep patients on it indefinitely. This is a six week course and then you can maintain it with lid scrubs. You could um, use this again, maybe in six months or a year, or two years, who knows, depends on the patient when that kind of returns. It's very lipophilic. So it gets into the meibomian glands and, and, and the lash follicles, which is the site that you want it to be present. Uh, BID dosings we talked about, it's a, there again, we talked about the origination of this was for ticks in cats and dogs and uh, for mange, which is Demodex. And the it, it works by, inhibition of a parasitic gamma aminobutyric acid gated chlorine channel. So what it does is it actually paralyzes the mite and it's a non-competitive antagonist. So there's no unbinding. It pretty much kills them on contact, paralyzes and death and uh, works well. So here's what it looks like. It's a novel class drug designed to eradicate demodex bite mites, working on GABA inhibition, which we just talked about. This might be one of the Demodex mites are the most videos. common ectoparasites found on humans. While they are highly prevalent in low numbers, an infestation of mites can lead to blepharitis and meibomian gland disease. There are two species of Demodex, Folliculorum and Brevis, that live on the skin of the face and eyelids. Demodex Folliculorum inhabits the eyelash follicles where they scrape the epithelial cell lining with their claws and excrete digestive enzymes to feed on the oily sebum deep in the follicle, causing inflammation, hyperemia, and irritation. Both species of mites can carry bacteria on their surface or in their gut, causing inflammation of the surrounding tissue. Demodex brevis prefers the rich mybum in the meibomian glands on the posterior lid margin. As the mites thrive in this nutrient-rich environment, they begin to proliferate, causing disease by mechanical, chemical, and bacterial mechanisms. This leads to more tissue damage and blockage of the glands and follicles, leading to further inflammation. The overgrowth of the mites in the follicle leads to follicular distension, misdirected lashes, matarosis, and irritation. As mites proliferate, the partially digested epithelial cells, keratin, mite waste, and eggs combine to form collarettes, which can be seen with a slit lamp. These collarettes are a pathognomonic sign of demodex infestation and are specific for demodex blepharitis. Patients also experience other symptoms of blepharitis, including redness, lid itching, and eye irritation. Well, that's all you probably wanted to see right there. It really kind of carries us to understanding. But the best way to look at it is just to look down. After 28 days of low lana, remember in the clinical trials, they couldn't rub the lashes. They could only put the drop in the eye twice a day. I do recommend rubbing, and I feel like I'm getting a huge impact very early on these patients with that extra step added in. I mean, you've got 30 to 50 microliters in a drop. Your eyes can only hold about 25 to 30. There's going to be excess drop, so why not use it in the lash, you know, base of the lashes where the follicle follicles are and where the demodex are. You know, in these the clinical, so this um, <clears throat> Lotal Lanner paper that was that I was uh, lucky to publish with a great group of researchers, and you know, basically looked at uh, overall, you know, study set up for Saturn II. This was the pivotal trial data. But that was the publication on it. Uh, Fifty percent of, and and I'll go through this a little bit with you in the actual slides here. So the this is what got the drug approved. The proportion of patients with two or less collarettes for the upper eyelid was the primary endpoint. Uh, proportion of patients with two or less in the sec as the primary endpoint, also for Saturn II. So these are your pivotal trials. Remember, in FDA, you have to have one. You have to pre-specify your endpoint compared to the vehicle, and then you got to repeat it. And the primary endpoint was at day 43. And you can see they met their p-value of less than 0.01 in both sides. You can see the difference between the two. Um, you know, down is about 55% of you know of patients were down to like two or less. And remember, they couldn't rub their eyelashes with this. They couldn't do anything other than put the drop in there and compare to the vehicle, which is sitting at around seven in the first study and 12 in the next study. That's highly statistically significant difference. So you can see why that was being approved. Now, that great data, very impressive eradication rates. Question now is, okay, 
safety. Most common uh, in about 10% of patients between the two studies, somewhere just under 10%, was burning upon installation. So you should educate patients about that. Um, installation site itching and pruritus was only 0.5% and 1.4 in the other study. And then the others were all very low amounts. In fact, even dry eye in the first study was zero and 1.5 in the next. So I think the main thing you wanna educate patients on is the potential for burning and stinging. Again, it was probably around, if you combine those two studies, around nine to 10%. Uh, still worth educating, but uh, so far, most of my patients have told me this was a very comfortable draw. So key takeaways, current strategies help but are not effective. Some of the high concentrations of like terpeniol, for example, or tetra oil are not very comfortable. Low concentrations don't do enough. There are some things with manuka and others that can help, but maybe not in the moderate to severe cases. IPL with an LLLT mask, like a blue mask, effective, but out of pocket cost and other options. So we really were in need of something for such a common condition. Uh, is either tolerability issues, cost issues, availability issues, or a severity untreatable levels. And so now we, we do have you know, data that show an FDA approved drug, easy to use, minimal side effects, six week duration, low toxicity, and quick eradication of the mite. So Demodex blepharitis is something you're gonna see tomorrow if you're not already diagnosing it. 60% of Americans visiting one of you is likely to have this. At least two cholerets is usually enough for diagnosis. Two and under is just kind of a watch. Uh, check for cholerets, the pathomonic sign, by doing nothing more than at the slit lamp, having the patient look down and increasing your magnification slightly. So we have one final approved FDA treatment for Demodex. I'd said none. It was a mistake. That must have been written right before the approval. This is approved, FDA approved and available uh, all, right away now uh, through their specialty pharmacies. And the effective, tolerable, and really a very welcome new medication to our armamentarium.